Well, I've heard it in reverse, too. I've gone to certain uh, regional theaters in, uh, uh, well, yeah. in, in Winnipeg, and the response is, no, we don't do that play. That's too Toronto. Yeah, the play was actually set in the Antarctic, <laughs> but it was actually too Toronto a play. But, so, you know, it's like I wonder, you know, I've always wondered there's certain things in this country we've never had major plays written about, or if they have, because I'm willing to believe someone's written them, they've not been produced. You know, in other words, they haven't been picked up. How could you have the FLQ crisis and never have a major Anglophone play written about that? That's a really important thing. How come uh, the Somali event, you, you know, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so Guillermo wrote A Line in the Sand, uh, never been done in this city except for a very small production, you know, how, how is it that those... How is that? I need an answer. I need your it? thoughts. Yeah, how is it? Because we, for a long time, avoided those kind of political. You don't want a political play. I get produced. Why did I get produced in those early years? When they produced me, they got rid of, and I think you've heard me say this before, they didn't have to do another Canadian play. They didn't have to do another play by a woman. They didn't have to do another political play. Uh, you know, and I was always on the brochure as one for your conscience. <laughs> you know, one for your heart, one for your funny bone, one for your, you know, and one for your conscience. You should and be I proud of being one for your conscience. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there was that, now we have, um, partly because you could say if we have scorched, he was in a position to produce that at, right. at the National Arts Center, right? right? Once again, we have in which an artist who was not somehow a kind of artistic producer kind of person being right. in a position to do work that that they they believe in but I'm not willing to believe that nobody writes about those plays they like say the FLQ crisis um, or any one of we a did, number we of did, other events we did do the FLQ crisis yeah, for October's English tele for tele English television and there was controversy of why should the Anglos tell this story there was pushback in French speaking Quebec from that. Well, you know, well, oh dear, well, then I guess we should never do that then, eh? Like, we don't want pushback. You know what I sure. mean? Pollock. <laughs> but that is a typical thing. Oh, you know, that don't make any, any, any waves. You heard about Marat Saad in London now, right, with everybody walking out and having yeah. huge seizures and there, it's interesting that when it was first done how many years ago yeah. same uh, theater I think it may be the RSC again nobody they didn't have walkouts and nobody was upset what does that say I want to talk about stories we're in the story arts so to speak in acting and directing in writing why story uh, because the human species has a compelling need to impose narrative. Why? Because it makes them believe that something makes sense even if their lives don't. I believe it may even be religious, right? It's like you're living, all you've got was three pages, you know, three sides of the major play, of, you know, the screenplay. It doesn't make any sense to you, that's your life. But we have a compelling need to believe that someplace there's the other, you know, 90 pages. And if we only had the other 90 pages, our three sides would make sense. So I believe that in some way, like you're, it, the theater in it is a life-affirming kind of number. You want, you go there to have some sense in the world imposed. Now that doesn't mean that you need sense in the play, like sense in the play, or that narrative can't emerge, I mean, though in a very small way, with Doc. I mean, that's what Guy and I talked about. What's the structure of this play? Well, it's a memory play, but it doesn't go back. I, I don't, I hate memory plays in a way, but you know, and so there it is, I'm writing them. But, um, uh, <laughs> but, um, but will they put it together when it isn't clear flashbacks, when we're moving back and forth in time, right? Well, you've said a story is a way of creating meaning or context to life. That's what you said? Yes. Have I paraphrased that? I think that's about right. But how the narrative emerges doesn't mean A makes B happen, makes C happen. 
or even yes. that where it be and we go back to A and then we move to C and so go back to The different forms of story and narrative, that's a separate discussion. Yeah. My question again is, why does narrative do that? Why does narrative or story put form, context, meaning, purpose on chaos life? Because we live in time. Because we're uh, cause and effect. Our lives are structured around time. Time has a narrative. Time goes, you know, we go forward in time. And so somehow that is knowable to us even if we play around with it in, in narrative, whether it's in novels or, or, or film or, any, or anything else. But there's still sequence of time dictates somehow to how we experience life and so we look for it. To us, I think that's a kind of coherence. Michael Levine, the designer, said that's basically what design is, to illuminate time. Not like tick, 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 but only purpose for design is in some way in a timeless place to somehow convey time. And not in the linear, the hour's over, not in that sense, but in but terms Not in time, of, period. Because you're saying without time, there's no narrative. If we didn't have a dimension of time, story, the convention of story would not exist. I guess that would be true. Like, like I'm trying to think what time would, without time, what time would be since, right. uh, what an absence of time would be. But is that why the Greeks use a unity of time? Is that why in a memory play you have a unity of time? in that the character or Kill a Mockingbird, a unity of time, the woman goes back and relives that cycle? Uh, I suppose we, I mean, even if we look at a lot of films, we had the flashback in film, which was a big idea, right? But that idea of the possibility of playing with time in order to add complexity or insight or you know, the whole idea of multiple points of view. I mean, uh, the, those things in a kind of a way, and I, there might even be a way to look at maybe visual art even in terms of that. Multi that, that is, um, I, I wouldn't say it's a modern idea, but it's a more, I mean, there, it, it's a different way of looking at things. Even if we look at history, where once there was the, um, the, the narrative, right? The historical narrative that was usually seen from these are important people and this is the lens through which we see stuff. Then all of a sudden you get, okay, these are the guys that lost. <laughs> now we have another kind of narrative. Right. And now we have the narrative of I'm in my cabin making bread or, you know, like then we go down to, so these right. multiple points of view somehow all get in Incorporated and narrative starts to not be as solid as it once was. Well, at my, my sort of linchpin is the Impressionists, right? When the Impressionists said, no, I'm not going to do the realistic painting. I'm going to do daubs. And in the daubs, we're going to start to see patterns and flowers and gardens and people. But I'm not going to draw the people. I'm not going to do the Rembrandt. That, that parallel, the, the time when physics was pushing and also atonal composing. Well, did you think it also had something to do with the, with the recognition of the individual? Yes, that's in there yeah. somewhere. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. That's the beginning of Romanticism, you know, yeah. the beginning of the 19th century, the, the individuals as opposed yeah. to the state. So what the you see in this is what you see yeah. in this. Yeah, but a, yeah. But music pulled apart as well. I mean, it's, it's yeah. Stravinsky is writing that at the same time that Einstein is talking about this. Suddenly, Stravinsky takes all the tonals and the scales and he just goes, nope not interested. And people revolt and they walk out of the theater and they say that's nonsense, that's barbarism. But in fact, it's a, it's a, a, f a greater in intimacy with potential disorder of what we live in. Um, sorry, I'm really... Yeah, but do you think, uh, but in, in terms of theater, <laughs> what implications does that have for theater? I want to go and ask that when we talked on the phone before, we had talked about the over literalization of storytelling that we're seeing now mm -hmm. on television, in film, and a lot of young writing. There's a very literal sense of telling the story. 
Do you, do you see that in the young writers that you're working with? Yes, yes. I think it's the influence of television most particularly. You know, um, and, I, and, I, and, and I think it's a loss. We talked about cultural literacy, the ability of a shared right. literacy when uh, you watch a performance, uh, something as simple as in certain cultures, don't, you, you never make a direct glance. You, you don't look into anybody's eyes. That would, that would be offensive for a man to look into somebody, yes. a woman's eyes. Or, or the sense of space, personal space in certain cultures uh, where you're intruding on my personal space and that's, I find that intimidating and yet for the person who's standing who's, in, I think, invading my personal space, that's their idea right. of an appropriate space between us. And so our theater, it seems to me that a lot of the non-verbal um, ways in which meaning is conveyed in the theater, which are the most interesting things, it's because all of the things that we spoke of in terms of moments that seemed, uh, that stuck with us, were not a piece of dialogue. They were visual images that spoke right. to Yep. something else that, that penetrated us yep. uh, in, in a way. Um, and, and our audience, which is primarily Caucasian, <laughs> uh, and shares a kind of North American cultural literacy without any sense of um, biblical references, a lot of the bedrock, common, you know, now I find in, in scripts that I get, the references are all film. And that means they last for two seasons. <laughs> you know what I mean? They'll, they're so you're, you're there's no sense of the past. And the past is kind of the cultural literacy on which we build subtext and larger meanings than what the play seems to be directly about. So is that an opportunity or a problem? To be suddenly released from you know, the overriding uh, cultural stories, be they the Bible, be they the classics, that held everything together for, you know, in the European sense, for 400 years, that every play was told in relationship to the Bible and the classics, but now the Bible and the classics, no one knows about them. And here we are with young writers doing, re referencing Three's Company, referencing CSI, referencing a television program or a film. So we're in a, is that a challenge? Is that a gift or is that a curse? Well, I think, uh, like another thing I hate is demographics. What it is is that you start to make your audience, the people who can access that, what's accessible to an audience, getting what it is. It's like me going to the Museum of Modern Art and only seeing one surface. Uh, it, it, it's even worse because in a lot of those young playwrights that are referencing certain um, uh, iconic figures, they figure, <laughs> you know, from television or whatever, are making references. Um, some part of that audience, unless it's all a young audience, a certain kind of audience, they simply don't get those, but they often get the feeling that they've missed it. In other words, they know it means something, but they don't know what it means. We carry with us because it's bred in the bone. It's that without me knowing the Iliad or the Odyssey, somehow the idea of the journey why, or the flood, you know, the disaster that those kind of things, that when that's part of your cultural background and you go to see a certain kind of play that on some level is somehow not that story, not referencing that story, but it penetrates me in a certain way because I have some kind of collective consciousness. I know this sounds ridiculous. You think this? You think this. So the, I you, sort of think this some days. So the, the, great, <laughs> uh, the grade nine student in Elmwood Collegiate who doesn't know the Iliad, who doesn't know the Odyssey, who doesn't really know the, the, those classical stuff. They can only live in this moment. Would have a residue of that awareness of Not those stories? No, because no. I, I don't know. I think that that's somehow what's being lost in us in right. a way. So that, so that they only live in a moment. Now what we've lost is any sense of a past in our present. And so the, we, we, we can only live in now, it seems to me.